Um, hi, my name is my name is Jason Yuan. This is my uh, I had someone draw a symbol for me. I said I wanted the Chinese Yuan sign, but like satan satanic and demonic and like from like Cyberpunk 2077. So this is now a prayer circle. Um, this is my name. Um, and uh, now that I'm looking at it, it's kind of weird and lonely on a slide. So uh, why don't I talk about some of the roles I've played in my lifetime instead? Um, like many of you, I've played the role of designer in air quotes. Um, and that's how some of you may kind of know my work. Um, most of my work is sort of this type of kinetic uh, animated typography. Um, I do work for type foundries like Klim Type Foundry. Um, and a lot of this is obviously generated. I'm not working with like real physical materials here. Um, I also work with musicians. This one was for uh, Jackson Wang in collaboration with Joe Perez. Um, I think he was part of the K-pop of GOT7. Am I, is that got, am I wrong? Okay, I'm so sorry. If there's any Jackson Wang, uh, Wang stands here, I mean, don't cast me on Twitter. Um, also worked on this piece for FK Twix in the weekends in collaboration with um, my friend Riley and Amber Grace Johnson, uh, who was the director of this film. I specifically worked on the typography motion. I uh, did not do the, the beautiful mask, you see. So um, just wanted to be clear of my contribution. Um, worked with Blackpink. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> also, um, this is for Harley Davidson Livewire, so like companies, musicians, um, recently worked with Inez and Manu with Chanel on the Coco Age collection last year featuring Miss Jenny Kim of Blackpink, obviously. But you know, some of you might have used this uh, calendar app called Cron. Um, and uh, I worked on uh, the entire identity system and the logo and the iconography and things like that. So as a designer, I've, like many of you, I've stuck my hands in many pots of honey. Um, now I'm also an inventor of sorts, which is like sounds like a super arrogant word, but it, you know, it kind of it is what it is. You know, uh, I've worked on obviously Mercury OS, which is uh, a project where this was kind of like my thesis, where I was reimagining the operating system. Um, I co-founded MakeSpace with some collaborators in 2020, which if you guys know about Figma, imagine MakeSpace is sort of like Safari and and telepresence, FaceTime, Zoom on the same shared canvas. Uh, also, some fun projects with collaborators uh, Omar Rizwan and Jeff Dooley. This one is called Hijack Your Feed. Um, we basically hack Twitter such that instead of showing you ads, it's showing you to-do list items. So you're scrolling through Twitter, you're like, oh my god, I need to order more cat food. And then you can press, you know, you can complete it and move on with your life. Um, recently also worked on Freeze Frame with Tyler Anger and uh, Simone Kaliski. Uh, basically bringing together this idea of window and state management and screenshots. So. Command Shift 2, boom, and you can pull up a previous session by looking at a timeline. So I've, I'm kind of like all over the place. I have all these like random labels. Um, but above all, I think I'm here today as, as a performer. Um, and I'm realizing just now, if I say I'm a designer, inventor, performer, it's giving like, it's giving like Karen energy. You know, it's like I'm on Twitter, and I'm like, you know, like, it's basically the same thing as those moms that go, mom, loving wife, follower of Christ. You know? <laughs> I just wanted to be clear, like, I, I know this is kind of ridiculous, which is why, for all intents and purposes, I'm a performer. That is who I am. Any design or art or invention work I do is in service of a performance. Um, and, you know, when I was younger, I was a theater kid. And this was me in acapella. And... You know, I look like discount Guy Fieri in all the photos, but I was like a really, I was, I was a theater kid, I was a theater kid, you know, this was high school, and now that we're talking about theater, Carnegie Mellon has one of the best acting programs in the entire world. It was like my dream school, I applied in 2014, <laughs> I flew all the way to New York to audition for the drama department, and uh, the lady uh, who runs acting, Barbara, you know, looks at me, like up and down, like that scene in Devil Wears Prada, and she's like, have you heard of Vassar? You should go to Vassar. Um, so I didn't get in here, obviously, <laughs> unfortunate. Um, so I, but I, I did end up going to Northwestern University, um, also for theater. And while I'm here, I would like to sort of point out that 
Northwestern University is ranked 12 spots higher. <laughs> so, I just wanted to, you know, this is just, it's just facts. I don't, I don't make the rules. Not both in mysterious ways. I'm here now. So, I have so much respect for this institution. So many of my best friends were here or, you know, are currently going here. And I'm really excited to be sharing my story as, an, as, a, as a performer who also happens to design and invent and make art. So, uh, are you guys ready? <laughs> cool. Uh, we're going to need more audience engagement here, okay? Um, so, like a true theater kid, I split my story into a few different acts. Let's start at the beginning with Act 1. Um, so I wasn't a very good actor at school, uh, which meant I ended up taking classes like stage design. And this was one of the models I made for uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest, set in sort of like a Japanese environment. Um, this was freshman year, and you know, while I was studying stage design, I came across the work of um, S. Devlin, and some of you might have heard of her. She's in this Netflix documentary called Abstract. Um, and she is a legendary stage designer and, and installation artist. She's worked with so many musicians and, and theater troupes. She's worked on the Lady Gaga Monster Ball Tour in 2010, uh, with Ye on Yeezus, and a bunch of other tours. Um, Beyonce Formation Tour, this is a sketch that she did. Um, Lord set at Coachella, and you know, Othello, Othello, I, I should know this, but um, you know, this was at the, I believe, um, somewhere in New York, I can't remember. But S. Devlin has this way of capturing the psychic energy, the, the, the feeling of, of, of a stage. Because when I first started doing stage design, I was thinking like, oh, like period piece, the, 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 the instructions say, put, put a couch here and, and a lamp here, and like, you know, it was about decoration. But S. Devlin, she really wraps the story and narrative at, at, into the stage itself, and she, she builds a world that the actors live on, essentially. And you know, she has this quote which I love. She says about Othello, this is not about castles and ships, it's about the storms that rage inside three people in the drawing room. And she's really designing the psychological space of, of the play. And so, as I was studying stage design, I, I was really inspired by her methodology and, and, and philosophy. Um, and I, uh, I was in Northwestern, and they had a lot of plays all the time, so I started making posters. Um, and a lot of my posters are, from early on, have a, kind of a theatrical style, ignoring the horrible typesetting. Um, and my style like, sort of got more and more graphic and abstract as going on, but I always try to sort of be inspired by or try to capture the psychic essence or of the storyline. For example, in uh, A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. I'm going to put the sheets down, not to interrupt you, but I'm going to put it down. <laughs> See the screen better. Cool. The screen. <coughs> you doing great. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's way better. Oh my god, when I was in design school, I was like, I made this comment, I was like, oh my god, this poster printed on matte paper looks a little lighter than glossy paper. And my professor turns to me and says, yeah, it's called contrast. Um, so that was um, unfortunate. Anyway, Tennessee Williams, streetcar named Desire. Many of you probably read this or read the spark notes of this for AP Lit or something. Um, it's about, you know, at, at its core, it's about, it's not just about, you know, it's about a man named Stanley and a woman named Blanche, but it's really about you know, femininity and this artful sensitivity and, and sort of uh, dreams and fantasy versus concrete masculine physical strength. Um, and so I try to capture this feeling of like, I guess like, you know, there is a layer of desire and lust, right? It's sort of like that scene in Titanic when there's like, a, it's like a steamy carriage and it's like a hand on the, you know, but it's, we, I worked with the director and we sort of used a, a tiger to symbolize Stanley's masculine strength and, and sort of preying on this moth drawn to a frame that is formed. Um, so that's one of, you know, my favorite, I think, pieces from back when I was in theater school. And like over time, I, I taught myself more design. I began to sort of branch out of making posters that look really dark and I was experimenting with color and form. Um, and to this day, this idea of creating a world and expressing the emotions in, in the design is still really important to me. Um, a few years ago, I worked with Interscope Records to create this ad for Blackpink when they were coming out with Love Sick Girls. Uh, I'll play it for you very briefly. So there's no sound, which means, oh. Okay, 
it's a bot, Stream Loves the Girls on iTunes. But um, it's a, uh, so essentially, they, they were just like, you have a um, 10 second loop, make it whatever you want. And Loves to Girls is this song about you know being lovesick, a little bit heartbroken, and the music video is like Rose driving away in a car and crying. And or maybe that was a different video. Anyway, but I was like, what do I do when I'm lovesick? Right? What does lovesick, what does like heartbreak feel like? And how does that work with this idea of unity? Because these four girls are together, lovesick together. And I'm thinking like I just broke up with my partner, I'm driving real fast, and these street lamps are going by me like like I can't, I can't really see it, but they're making these shapes, and so that's why in this piece I sort of kind of had this idea of these street lamps filling up this little heart, um, and it's sort of cast on this hypography, like it's almost like a cityscape, like the city is reflected by the the, the, the lights on the street. It, it, it's, it, it really felt like I was making another set model, like I was back in school, and and so this was a really special project for me to to work on, because it really felt like. Um, like a full circle moment, I suppose. Um, of course, Inez of Anu then sort of saw this, and they're legendary d directors, and they've worked, you know, with Chanel for ages. They worked in all sorts of music videos, and uh, Chanel had this. Uh, they had this sort of uh, collection called Coco Nage, which is their ready-to-wear collection inspired by uh, winter sports like skiing and snowboarding. And so they were like, "Can you make um, an animation uh, for the logo?" And can you do like a crystal ball with a Chanel logo and, and snow is filling up inside? And I just kind of thought like, well, if it's winter sports, why would the snow be kind of just floating around? Like, can we capture the, the essence of, of speed and excitement in the type and the form itself? So I pitched this uh, treatment, this is a style frame, so it's static, where we create the Chanel word mark out of, out of snow and we literally just blow wind on it such that it's almost like you have the energy of, of, of the movement reflected in the, in the physics of the type itself. And if you look closer at the garment itself, they, they have the typography printed on the garment that kind of resembles like little ski trails intersecting. Um, we didn't end up going in this direction because it felt a little too overtly wintry. So this was what we ended up with, is kind of like a little mixture. Um, and we used some of the colors um, on the garments instead. Um, but I just sort of want to show, like, you know, like, there's so many different ways to interpret and express, like, the the world that you're building. Um, and also, you know, when I was working with uh, Harley Davidson on Livewire, it's their electric vehicle, electric room, room, what is it? Motorcycle? Um, <laughs> and they were like, can you create a, a, a boot up animation when you, you know, turn on your vehicle? So I, I was thinking, like, what is this? Well, this logo looks like it's in motion. So, like, what does driving real, like, vroom vroom really fast feel like? Because I've never been on a motorcycle, and if you ride a motorcycle and and it's not, you know, muffled and you just make noise for no reason, it's like electric chair, you know. But so I, I don't have much personal experience, but I was like, you know, what if it's like you're going through a tunnel, and then the tunnel is actually the, the logo, you know? Um, but then I felt like this didn't really work with the shape of the logo itself, because the logo seems to be moving like on the x and y axes, but this was on the z axis. So then we were like, okay, what about having it sort of coalesce together? Um, and that seemed a bit closer, but it still it was like it's too much. It's like dog wagging its tail in front of me. I don't like it. So we sort of ended up like this feeling of you're standing um, on a sidewalk and like. Angela Jolie goes like in front of you, stops by, winks, and then like drives off. And that's the logo. So it's meant to feel, it's almost like you are a spectator in the audience and something's happening on stage. And so I guess the takeaway for Act One um, is sort of like it, inspired by Estelle, and I think really think design is about world building. It's about figuring out you know, the physics of the world, um, the characters that live inside the motivations of these characters, how it feels to live in this world. Is it heavy? Is it dense? Is it bright? Is it optimistic? And then capturing that in whether it's, it's typography or, or a product or UI or whatever, um, I think is at the crux of what we do. Brief intermission as I drink water. Alrighty, so I was really bad at acting, right? And this was me with my acting class. Um, and I kind of kept taking acting because I felt like it was a really good thing to just learn as like a life skill. Um, and my time learning acting in Northwestern was some of the most transformative times of my life. And we, 
we were a true ensemble. We got together, we made art, we cried together, we woke up at 8 a.m. to talk about past trauma. It was real intense, and we, we were, you know, deeply philosophical discussions online, too, um, like this. Um, you know, just like, I, I can't even, like, and, and it, you know, our professor, David Catlin, I mean, he, I sort of just wanted to call him out because like he's had such a huge impact on my life and he would always say, you know, acting is not about playing pretend, it's about truth. And to be honest, up until then, or and I know many people here might also feel this way, when you think acting, you're like, oh, it's like fake. It's like you're, you're, you're doing a fake thing, you're pretending to be something else. But um, if you think about it, acting is really about relating to universal human truths and expressing it. Uh, to people in the form of a story. So take this character Hamlet, which I'm sure is, sounds quite familiar. There's so many different versions of Hamlet played by so many different actors and actresses and non-binary word for actors. Um, and I played Hamlet a bit in college too. And I'm not a 30-year-old European man in 1602 whose uncle murdered my dad. My uncle and my dad are on very good terms, you know? <laughs> but it's, and if I were to go on stage and pretend that I'm, you know, from Dan Denmark, it would just, it would not work, and it would frankly be a little bit insulting. Um, but I can relate to several universal truths that Hamlet experiences, right? I can relate to feelings of loss, of, of grief, of, of betrayal, of not knowing who to trust, of, of looking at yourself in the mirror, and wishing you weren't there, of, of deep self-loathing. I can relate personally to all of these emotions and I can channel that in my acting such that when I play Hamlet, and, and when I say, you know, oh, that this tutu solid flesh would thaw, you know, like, it, I completely butcher that line, but it, it comes across more honest because I, I'm being honest about my experiences. I'm not thinking like, oh, my uncle killed my dad. It's like, oh, I'm thinking about a different thing. So acting really, like to me, is about embodied emotion. And I like to take this idea and put it into my work, especially for emotion work. Um, so for example, I worked with Clint Type Foundry on, uh, he was creating this typeface <coughs> called Neostrom Sons. And these are some of his sketches. And Milstrom Sons looks like this. It's, uh, it's what we would call reverse, sort of, the, the, the weights are reversed. It's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, reverse stressed, I think is the term. Correct me if I'm wrong, if there are any type experts here. Um, and and the, 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 usually um, in a T, the, the hat, you're probably gonna roast me so hard. This part would not be heavier than the stem, you know? But this typeface, and, and, and Chris, uh, the, the, the designer behind Chris, uh, Clint Type Foundry, says, you know, it's meant to feel perverse, right? It's meant to feel like it's weird, like these, this, this, this type doesn't make sense. There's an uneasy mix of heavy horizontals and, and diagonals, and these typefaces feel fragile and delicate. And I want you to go and make a series that feels perverse, grotesque, and gross. And at first, I wasn't really, like, thinking as an actor. I was just, like, thinking as, like, a 20-year-old, like, LOL, like, 69 is so gross, haha. -ha. Let's write 69 and have it be made of hair, ooh, so edgy. Um, doesn't really work. It's like, it kind of looks fluffy and like looks like a pet, not really gross. Um, so I kind of went back to the drawing board and, and I kind of, you know, did a little bit of method acting where this actually happened to me, where I went to my friend Vivian's house and she had a Brita filter that was wearing mold on it and, her, and the water was green. And it was deeply disgusting, because I was like, Vivian, why is her matcha in your Brita filter? She's like, this is water. <laughs> and I felt visceral disgust, because I had just consumed, you know, like, not matcha. And, and, and you know, if you've ever seen the way mold grows in a petri dish, it's like, really gross, right? Sorry, I should have added content warning. Um, so I was like, actually, that's really gross. Let's grow typography using like a mode growth algorithm, whatever. So I started from scratch and I made this M. And the idea was to have it sort of spindle out of nowhere and then like splash towards you, like someone who just washed their hands and went like this. Um, 
And like this wasn't like this isn't like the most disgusting thing out there, but it felt like it sort of unlocked a world that we could then begin to live in, right? And after that, the ideas just kept coming. I was like, oh, for the A, let's let's make it go through purity. Let's like give it pubes, and then and then let's have these pubes slowly flake off, and you have the little goosebumps on the skin. Let's have this person not exfoliate. Um, let's have you know tentacle porn. Let's have like you know things coming out of like little you know um, little crevices everywhere, um, and and let let let's give. Let's give this thing puberty again and give it acne. Give it really bad cystic acne. You're gonna need Accutane. It's getting so much acne and it starts popping. And the puss is popping out that way. And it's super gross. But also kind of, you know, I guess some people are into that. Um, and, you know, it's so gross that I'm beginning to think about vomiting. When I think of vomiting, I think of my stomach. When I think of my stomach, I think of tapeworms kind of like just writhing in there. Um, and these things all kind of feel gross. And I was like on a roll. And then I was like out of ideas. Um, as, you know, this is very normal. We, we, every single creative person has felt this way. I'm sure many of you feel this way now. Um, and so I went to look for inspiration. I went to watch horror films um, because I wanted to. And I saw. I think this was The Grudge. And there's you know the scene where this, the, the, the the ghost climbs out of like slimy things um, and out of a well. And I was like, that could be gross intellectually. This is foreshadowing, by the way, because. What happened was, I created this, and it wasn't gross, it kind of felt like like extraterrestrial, like ethereal, but it definitely wasn't gross. It just didn't feel right. Um, so then, I'm like, okay, let's try a different metaphor. Let's try uh, chicken skin. Chicken skin is gross. I don't like eating raw chicken skin. Let's just have this, this raw chicken sort of just like do this. And like, I guess that's kind of gross if salmonella is, you know, is public health concern. But it's not quite, it doesn't have the <clears throat> factor, you know, you don't really feel it. So then I watched another horror film called The Exorcist. Um, and there's so many scenes where it's sort of, there's a lot of like body horror, like bones creaking in different directions and like, <laughs> this is when I have to wake up and realize I have to go to work, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, let's... I got it, let's give the chicken skin an exorcism. And so, I filmed myself getting exercise and I basically just did this to the, it's sort of like, you know, praying to God and then it gets crucified at the end. It's actually a really nice loop. And all of this was, you know, um, simulated physics, like flag dynamics or clock dynamics in Cinema 4D, um, just used very creatively. And we felt like, yeah, this is kind of gross. Um, and, and it really came from a place of acting and embodying this, like, what is going to make you physically go, like, oh my god, you know? Um, and the funny thing is someone messaged me on Instagram after we posted this, and they were like, where did you film this? As if I, like, puppeted the thing. Anyway, so, really into skincare, was into pore strips. Let's, like, do a pore strip thing on this letter. And also, like, you know when your nail starts to split and you, yeah, kind of gross. Um, now an outtake. So, we're moving on to O, and... I was thinking like, oh, orgasm, ha ha ha, so gross. Let's create a vaginal shape and let's have it just do this. Um, very gross, kind of immature. Didn't work at all with the typography because the type is supposed to feel fragile. I forgot, I've forgotten about the assignment. I went too far in the other direction. This feels fat, this feels thick with two C's, okay? It's not fragile. So we just ended up doing like sort of a bacterial growth instead and that was the series. Um, this sort of mindset of embodying an emotion also, you know, I, I did this for a separate film I made for Interscope and Black King for Pretty Savage, which I'll play here. So at the end, when the savage kind of bites down on the... It, it's sort of, I was like, what is savage? What is a slave? It's like, savage. <laughs> We're saying savage. We're like, you know? And like, that's what I try to capture sort of like uh, metaphorically with, with this piece. Um, so, you know, for all of these pieces come from my internal truth, what I find gross or savage or whatever. Um, and I think as designers, we should be trying to think about, you know, the same way actors look at universal truth of emotion, we should be leaning into the universal truth of like, what does love feel like? What does loneliness or grief or gross or savage or slave? What does a slave feel like, you know? Um, and to a certain extent, that can be universal, but you know, not all truths are universal. 
right? And this is kind of where I get a little bit preachy about inclusion and representation. In like, I can't go on stage, and if there was ever a play about you know George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, I cannot be the person who plays George Floyd. I do not understand what it feel. I can empathize with, but I am not black. I cannot possibly understand and embody what it feels like to be under attack in America as a black person. And in this case, like it has to be a black actor or actress playing that role of George Floyd. And it is their truth and their story, and we are here to listen. In the same way in design, you know, I'm probably not the best person to design something for blind people. I know you think about user research and things like that, but truthfully speaking, like this is why we need people of different abilities and races and backgrounds and religious in the room because they can then apply their truths and their perspectives in the design in a way that we can't possibly, you know, all fit into one person. Um, so that's my little uh, Twitter Twitter thread there. Um, okay, Act Three starts getting interesting, right? I'm at Northwestern. I'm doing all this like, you know, student work um, for for these little uh, for these uh, plays and, and these student groups. And Northwestern doesn't really have a design program. They have design classes, but there's no design major. So I was just teaching myself. And I was my junior year, and I was getting a little anxious. I was like, I need a job. Um, and uh, Apple came to campus to recruit for PR, and I harassed the recruiter into talking to me for design. And I, you know, went through a few rounds of interviews for Apple Music, and I was really excited because I had all these ideas of how Apple Music could, you know, at the time, I thought it would be better. And uh, they ended up turning me down with the phrase, you know, we would like for you to continue your formal training, which to me, if you had said literally anything else, I would have been slightly okay. But at the moment, I was like, what formal training? Like, where the fuck am I going to find formal training? Like. Can I swear? I, you know, it's fine. Um, <laughs> where, where? Like, I'm, I'm not in a design school. I don't have resources. I'm, I'm, I, what do I do? And I, so, I, at the time, I had already been thinking about Apple Music for so long and I had these ideas. Um, I ended up just, well, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put them down in an article somewhere and publish it and so I can move on with my life. Um, and, and, and I published this article called I Got Rejected by Apple Music, so I redesigned it. <laughs> And it completely changed my life. It just blew up all over the internet. I went to sleep after publishing it. I woke up and I had 96 missed calls. It was on like you know Reddit. It was on like 95 Mac, Mac Rumors, and these news sites. And these people were calling me. And finally, for the first time, I had an audience who were open to my non-traditional background, who wanted to hear me out, who were open to giving me an opportunity to to design. And from this experience, you know, it's not really about the idea itself, I guess, but I, I, I think what was most important is I learned that spectacle is so powerful because by creating this piece and putting it online publicly, it drew people to the piece. It's like people got on a little boat and floated towards me because they saw something shiny and they wanted to come towards it. And it was almost like uploading, like, it, it's almost like I was auditioning myself. You know how actors send audition reels to, to different uh, directors? It was like that, but like on the, on, on the internet scale. And so, to this day, I still believe that, like, spectacle um, is, is, is really powerful, and a lot of, you know, peers in design sort of like to say, like, oh, you know, that's just marketing, it's just like personal branding, like, it's about the work. And I'm like, no, nobody cares until you give them a reason to care. Don't underestimate the value of spectacle. Um, and the second thing is that everyone loves an underdog. And this is because we read all these stories and people love identifying with underdogs. People love you know, this narrative of this, this, this uh, person fighting against an incumbent. And people identify with the theme of underdog. That's why we hear people quote, you know, here's the crazy ones or think different. That's why those campaigns worked because it speaks to the underdog. Everyone wants to feel like an underdog. Everyone wants to root for an underdog. And I knew that, and I kind of used it to my advantage. And because in that moment, I did feel like I was an underdog, and it, it worked. So the storytelling technique there really transformed my career. And yes, I did eventually end up interning at Apple, but um, it, the, the important thing is sort of like the, the effects of, of that show, basically, that I put on is the reason why I'm standing here today. Um, and I, I will never sort of, you know, 
underestimate that. Um, so around the time I was at Apple, I began thinking a lot about like this idea of ergonomics. Um, you know, like what makes something feel good or easy to use, right? And I was entering my last year at RISD. Um, so I was thinking of like, okay, computers, I have, the, I have a hunch, I have this hunch that computers aren't super, super ergonomic. But I, I, I can't quite place it. I, I don't know what it is, but I want to figure it out. So I started doing all these sketches of hardware, like, you know, like uh, a ring that's like a click wheel. You just kind of like fidget with a ring like this and you do stuff. Um, I, I, I drew different ideas for like interfaces inspired by gaming. Um, and I just like randomly made drawings because I was just thinking about like, you know, what if, you know, we could resize an app tile to something larger, um, which is kind of foreshadowy, but anyway, um, you know, like just what, 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 does the, what does ergonomics mean, right? And then over time it evolved into something like that looks a little bit like a flow or a timeline. And this is when I realized that the problem wasn't necessarily the hardware by itself per se that wasn't feeling super ergonomic, it was that the mental ergonomics of our computers and, and systems weren't there. The, 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 the mental structures, the architectures, the world that we, we live in on our devices aren't that ergonomic at all. Um, and at this time, I was also diagnosed with ADHD, which means suddenly my entire life was explained, right? Like, I have horrible executive function, a terrible memory. Um, I forget things, like, all the time, such as I just forgot that I just told you I have bad memory. Um, and I can't be productive unless I'm in flow state. And what flow state means is sort of, you know, my skill level is matching the anticipated challenge of the, of the task. And a lot of things on a computer, like naming your files, finding that essay you wrote last week, replying to that email sent from the IRS, and but it's just so boring. It's like low skill tasks, like, oh my god, like why? Like why, why, why is this my desktop? This is not my desktop, but why is this my desktop? And what, what does you throw ASL mean? I just noticed, anyway, it, my desktop looks like this. You know, why is this, why, why do I live in this world? Who is this for? Right? I have an intent. Why do I have all the shit in front of me? I have all these files. I have all these fucking apps. I just want to do the thing that I want to do. And sometimes, you know, I set out and I'm like super jolly and suddenly I get a freaking notification and then I completely forget what I'm about to do and I circle back two days later. Why is this happening? Like, why, do we, why, do I, why am I living like this? You know, I'm, I'm getting really passionate about this. Um, and, and, and then I started looking into human computer interaction, HCI. Um, and I was like, hold on, like the desktop metaphor was invented in like 1973. That's not that long ago. Like, I'm pretty sure Madonna was alive back then, too. Yeah, like it's not that long ago, right? But this was built and designed by like a small group of, you know, engineering folks, and it wasn't necessarily built for people like me, with, you know, who especially struggle with executive function. It, really, it just wasn't. It doesn't, it's not my truth. Maybe it's their truth, but it's not mine, and this world doesn't feel economic. And so I was like, how do we bring humans closer to the intent, you know? Um, and nowadays, we have technologies like Dolly, right? Um, you write anything, and it generates a picture. So my project, basically, retroactively, I can use this now as a metaphor to explain, what if, like, Dolly was an operating system? You write or you talk about any intent you have, and it just generates the UI that you need. Um, so I made this little demo, I think, in December. And the idea was, you know, I have this inbox flow, and it, it captures all of my sort of emails, but also my direct messages were DMs. Because when I want to clear my inbox, it's not just about the email app. It's not just about my Twitter DMs. It's all communications. And I was imagining this almost command line-esque NLP interface that allowed me to just do anything to the GUI elements. Um, and looking at this sort of interface here, it begins to feel kind of familiar to some of the stuff that we see um, that are coming out of the AI world now, where it really is all about, um, back then I called it search, but if I were to go back and redo it, I think it would just be like declare, or tell us what you want, or something like that, right? Um, and it, it's really like language is, is such a powerful tool because we already practice language. We don't have to, you know, it's not like code where every day you have to keep practicing code to be fluent at code. You use language in real life in human society, therefore, why can't that be 
our way of communicating with computers. Um, and I was showing this demo to lots of people. And a lot of the feedback I was getting sounded like this, word for word, why are you thinking about operating systems? Leave that to the 45-year-old creative directors. And I just felt like that was bullshit. But I kind of internalized a little bit of it, and it would affect me later. But at the time, I was like, yeah, fuck that shit. Like, you crusty old groomer. Like, shut up. <laughs> but, but in that moment, I realized I was feeling a bit alone. I can't, this question is bigger than myself. I can't just do this by myself. I need help, right? So I came to Carnegie Mellon and visited my friend Marissa. And I look like Guy Fieri in this one as well. <laughs> I think this was like in your industrial or robotics lab, whatever. And we just stayed up, we just sketched concepts. We just, you know, think we thought about piles, um, you know, object-oriented object operating system, the same way that I have piles of, of, you know, like papers, mail at home. Can I just put all my UI into a pile? Uh, pile? Can I sort of have the horizontal flow of different UI and use language to, to declare the next step? And we just drew all of these, you know, UIs and, and, and all of these ideas, and Marissa actually helped me sketch this mental model of what eventually became Mercury, which is any task you do, sort of you, you, you keep doing it until you want to pivot, and then you keep doing that pivot, and then you pivot again. It sort of looks like a little ladder. Um, and that was like a big moment for me, it was like finally figuring out like what this potential speculative world might feel like. Um, but I needed help sort of realizing it, so then um, I went to my friend Dennis. This is us recently. We uh, we met for the first time after after four years in, in, in Paris. But Dennis is fantastic. He's currently a, a design engineer at Snapchat, I think. Um, and I was sort of explaining Mercury, and we were brainstorming in, in this tool called Figma, um, and we were just you know chatting in this tool. And um, I think I was pretty depressed back then. Um, and at some point, I started zooming out on our conversation because we had made this artifact. And I was like, huh, um, it kind of looks like a ladder, doesn't it? Like, a, sorry, steps, right? It kind of looks, why does this look so familiar? Why does this look like that drawing that I had just made of Marissa? Uh, well, is, is this actually, maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe, maybe the model is just go as deep into the flow as you want until you want to pivot, and we'll just keep supporting it however deep you want to go and you pivot again. Maybe that is the model, because that's how we already have our conversations. We, have, we are already using Mercury OS, but in Figma. Anyway, so then I'm like, okay, I'm like super excited. I'm like, I, I, I have momentum. Like, how do I use all this energy? Um, and then my mentor at the time, Jody Liu, who um, is, you know, she also teaches at RISD sometimes. She, we were brainstorming, and, and she wrote something down that, you know, I'll never forget. She says, you have to make them feel what you're feeling. You have to make them feel that this new world can feel different. Um, and that's when I realized that I had to, the, the task wasn't to design the perfect end-to-end -end system. It was to tell a compelling spectacle of a story. Um, I also discovered this book by Jeff Raskin, which I encourage anyone interested in HCI to read. And Jeff Raskin helped invent the Macintosh. Um, and he describes like what he believes to be a humane interface in this, in this book. And when I was reading through it, so many parts stood out as a sort of just ways that certain, um, like, certain things I was thinking were just phrased by Jeff in such an eloquent way. And it, it truly just like, it felt like I had all these guardian, guardian angels in the world that were coming to sort of help me express the story. So, um, I ended up writing a story about it and putting on Medium, and because Medium's my my thing, I guess. Um, and it was it was it was it wasn't like a dry like this is how it works. It was like a, I tried to make it a little more poetic and a little more artful and, and sort of sound like a true story that you know of, of someone with with neurodivergent differences trying to solve and create a world for themselves. Um, and so. You know, if you haven't seen Mercury, the general idea is the computing experience starts with a prompt, what do you want to do? Um, if you don't know, you just scroll up and you see like a history of different intents you've had previously. If you do know what you want to do, you can say, I want to review inbox, or you can tap on review inbox, and it takes you to a screen of, of all your inbox items, whether it's mail or you know, DMs or whatever, anything that is inbox related. However, if you need to do something related to your inbox, you can sort of move horizontally. So my friend asked if I'm free for coffee, 
I don't want to open my calendar app or check my reminders. I want to stay in my review inbox flow that I'm in. I just want to make a little detour. So I, I can just press this plus button, and then it can sort of predict for me what I might want, where I can just ask it. And I can make as many detours as I want, but when I'm ready, I can just scroll up and move on. I'm staying in the review inbox flow, but I'm allowed to make as many detours as I want. I can be as ADHD or as, as distractible as I want, and the system is supporting me because the system is designed for me. It's a world that I live in. If my friends and I are talking about finding housing in Mountain View, which pro tip don't, um, <laughs> you can just highlight Mountain View, and since it's AI, wavy, hand wavy AI, um, you just, you know, boom, Airbnb pops out, you know? And so my process for Mercury has been a series of asking why, right? And like, that's what S. Devlin does for shows too, on a more, you know, meta scale. She's like, why is this show created? You know, what is it really about? Why does it need to happen? Why did it need to be written? Who needs to see it and why? So for me, I'm solving a personal problem. Who am I publishing this for? I'm publishing, I published it for sort of everyone who finds that computers just don't seem to feel right, but then they feel gaslit because their kids go up to them and go like, Mom, you're just like dumb, you don't know how to use folders. And I, 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 just, I did this so that we could all start questioning, like, why is it that a handful of people in California, Redmond, whatever, gets to decide how our world works virtually? We live in these worlds defined by these tiny, tiny handful of people. Is that right? Is that how the world should work? Why can't we imagine our own futures? You know, and I know tech can be a little bit stuffy and, and full of people with like, you know, who are super technical. So I sort of deliberately made the art direction kind of out there. I deliberately started sort of my, my storytelling with another article called The Desktop Metaphor Must Die. I don't actually think we need to kill it. I think it, would have to, it wouldn't be the most humane thing to do, but it was a very dramatic statement that made it cause a spectacle and sort of made an impact. And for me, that was what I wanted to achieve. Um, at the risk of sounding like, I guess, arrogant or hubristic or hyperbolic, um, I, I think like, what I really wanted to achieve was for people to care about this problem. Um, and thankfully, lots of people did. And so, after Mercury, I learned that you know, there's so much power in the ensemble. I talked about my acting class. We were all there for each other. I sort of found my own people, Carnegie Mellon, and my professors, and my mentors on the internet, and they helped me shape sort of this narrative, make sense of my thoughts, and it was really like an ensemble collaborative piece, because without them, I would just be spinning down the stairs by myself, and no, you know, I would be alone. There's no power in doing just a monologue, right? Um, and again, again, like design is a performative act. It's not, you can create impact by shipping something and putting it into people's hands, but there's another type of impact you can create through speculative work, through performative work, that, you know, if the world is heading in this direction and you see a future over there, your job as a designer is to run all the way over here and say, like, look at me, like, look at this thing, like, sh isn't this great? Like, I have, like, free air conditioning here, come here. And then everyone who's over here might be like, huh, that guy looks super annoying. Let's see what he's about. And maybe they will pivot one or two degrees this way. And maybe then you can start shaping the path of, that people will take. Maybe people won't go over here at all. Maybe, you're, maybe people don't want free air conditioning. But it's kind of just like, this is how you can also have impact on the world through, through a spectacle. And maybe slowly but surely one day, we will meander to the destination of the future utopia, whatever it is that we imagine. Um, so in this metaphor, the story is the destination. And to quote a friend of mine, Eugene Angelo, um, he says, images are like boats. As designers, as creatives, your superpower is to create images and films and or to write and, 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 and sort of use that to your advantage. If someone has, you know, there's people with aphantasia, which means they can't imagine things, and like you have to show it to them, right? And it's a real thing. But um, it, it's sort of like, not everyone's gonna imagine the same thing as in your head, but you can bring them there through your skill set as image makers, as mythology makers. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, so our story is kind of reaching a sort of, a little bit of a climax moment, um, and this is kind of like where like fatal character flaws and stuff start getting exposed. Um, and this section, this final arc of my story, starts with 300 lines of code. Um, so I mentioned Jeff Raskin, who wrote The Humane Interface. Um, his son, Aza, um, noticed my work on Mercury, 
and was like, hey, I'm in San Francisco, why don't you come like visit and we can hang out? Um, and I was like, I was like, oh my god, like I, I felt like I was meeting BTS, you know. Um, <laughs> he runs with uh, Tristan Harris, they co-founded Center for Humane Technology, and if you've ever seen the film Social Dilemma, they helped produce that. Um, so Aza's like a veteran industry, and he's like, he's, he tells me like, you know, years and years ago there was a rift in Silicon Valley where we could we could have gone one way to sort of empower people's creativity, or go the other way way and start extracting people for resources and attention, and we pivoted that way. But he remains hopeful that we can pivot back. So we became friends, and we were hanging out. March 2020 happens, COVID hits, we started hanging out on Zoom, and Aza. You know, I was pretty down at the time, and Aza's, you know, like, hey, I'm working on this thing, why don't you check it out? It's a, uh, I wrote 300 lines on top of, 300 lines of code on top of Figma, and now you can use Figma as a web browser. You can literally make a frame, and title that frame whatever website you want, and now you can browse the web. And it's shared. And that was, it blew my mind. I was going insane. I was like, oh my god, like, do you not realize what you've made? You've made a new operating system. This is a new, this is a um, I, so, so, so this is an actual artifact of me experiencing this for the first time. Suddenly, I had so many ideas. I'm like, oh my god! Like, what if we could have? If if, the, if, 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 if websites were like objects, then we can have invisibility cloaks. I can put an invisibility cloak over this website I'm looking at, so you can't tell how um, perverted my mind is or whatever. And oh my god, if it's physics, then maybe we have a little box that you you, you can't go inside, and I'm looking at the website. And 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 why not put our faces in here? Why not? Why are we on Zoom? Why can't we? Why can't we doctor face? Why can't we just do this? Why can't I move my mouse and, and just and do this? Why can't I play in this world? Why can't I exist? Where's my avatar? Where's my MMO moment? Um, so, you know, I, I came up with this idea of face docking, where your 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 face is following your cursor, but you can draw any shape and you can put your face in that shape. What this means, obviously, is then you can have slightly, you know, interesting meetings where have like different. Oh my God, my hair looks horrible. Have different shapes of sort of like you can meet with your friend, but if you then start taking a step back, you're like, hey, websites work on this platform. We can literally have an auditorium with a live keynote and a big speaker and just people sitting like this. We can kind of mimic the stagecraft of the real world in this virtual world. Not saying that this is a good solution, but it, it was very compelling to demo. Um, and this project just started accelerating. Lots of people started becoming interested in it, um, and collaborators became became sort of drawn to it and sort of flooding in. And we had ideas of like you know spatial audio, um, audio scales depending on distance. And if we want to have a private conversation, we we make a rectangle, name it room, and now we're in a room, and audio is stuck in that room. And and this was like that big mind blown moment happened to everyone we showed this to. And it was the coolest, it was the most amazing feeling ever. It felt like everything was going to change. And we, we were so excited about it. Um, oh, oh, and there's another thing, which uh, if you pull down command and click, you can leave a face stamp, a face sticker, which uh, I like playing this game called Overwatch. In Overwatch, you can press T, and you can leave like a little spray somewhere. I sometimes do that, and then I and then I die, and my team flames me. But I'm like, it'd be super fun to just like leave little artifacts for yourself all over your shared space for the future, and and it's just it's just fun, you know. It's really fun. It's playful. It makes you it's visionable. This world feels lived in, you know. Um, and we did live in it. We had our internal meetings in this world. We literally dragged in a PNG of an actual sofa, and we just sat on it. You know, we 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 had our we started our team meetings by literally face stamping where our mood was on this cat uh, meeting. You know, we and, like and the, the, this was one of the only <coughs> surviving screenshots I can find. Sort of, it it really begins to feel like a lived-in world that we could share in. It, it felt like um, for the first time, what I'm doing here now, spending time with you guys. I'm not just sitting in an empty cubicle and like talking to you like I am in Zoom. We are sharing an experience together. And it felt like Mace Day was, was the way to do that. Um, and like this was really, we, we just looked like we were having so much fun. We just couldn't help but smile. And, and we even used this little hacky tool of ours to, to try to name it, um, our, 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 our project, our product. Um, and you can see like a lot of this is like you know, Figma tools, but the space, unlike the 
generic Figma screen feels, you know, it feels legit. It feels like someone messed this room up and left. Um, I'm getting kind of emotional looking at it. And, and so to us, it wasn't just a fun new way to hang out. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was something new. It was post-COVID, it was post-desktop metaphor, post-internet, post-single player, post-tech, post-zero park, post-Mozilla, post-capitalism, multiplayer first, clean slate operating system. We were so excited and we launched it and this was the opening video. And, and, and we were just like, this is gonna change the world. Um, and, and it, um, well, You know, I'm also signing because Kino is refusing to, to do what I wanted to do. But another part of me is signing because it, things don't turn out the way we want it to. And MakeSpace now, as MakeSpace, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and a lot of that, you know, was, I, I take responsibility for a lot of that. Um, but part of it was, like I was talking about earlier with a streetcar named Desire, um, this idea of reality will eventually triumph fa over fantasy. Um, and we had all these high hopes about MakeSpace. We, 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 we thought you know, it was going to be a not-for-profit. It was not going to be you know, a traditional capitalist-funded company. It would be like a Xerox park. It would be all creative. It would be a completely flat structure. We could all create we could all participate in this new world. This narrative wasn't just about this new product. It wasn't like Mercury, oh, here's a new operating system. The narrative that we were actually trying to tell was a creation of a post-capitalist system that eventually, I think, we you know, didn't end up actualizing. Um, and as, 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 inter as, as cool and as life-changing as spectacles can be, sometimes a spectacle is just a show. And, and shows are ephemeral. Um, and more importantly, I take responsibility because I lost sight of my own narrative. Um, I mentioned earlier, my entire career, people have been telling me, like, stop dreaming so big, like, think smaller, like, don't think about operating systems, or, you know, you're so junior, you're so junior, you're whatever, whatever. And I would say, yeah, 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 fuck you. But over time, it, it adds up. It's like, it builds up in your system. And I had, by that time, internalized this narrative that people were projecting onto me from their experience. And I felt like, yeah, I guess I am inexperienced and junior, and I, I don't think I should be leading the product, you guys. Like, I don't think I can be CEO. Why don't someone else be CEO? Why don't I just sit and wait for things to happen? What do you need help with? I'll assist you. And, and I just kind of made myself smaller and smaller and smaller. But what the product and the team needed was, was a leader. And I, I, I wasn't one. I wasn't, I wasn't a, a great leader. Um, and you know, looking back at my entire career, narratives and stories aren't just about you know, a, pulling gravity and, and getting other people to look at you. It's, it's actually a way of self-actualization. Self when I was making the Klim Thai Foundry uh, series, the way this happened was Chris, he found one of my Instagram posts and followed me, and I DM'd him, hey, let's collaborate. And he's like, okay, I have this idea for this series, can you make it? I had like two months of experience in Cinema 40. I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I was like, yeah, I can do it. I'm a really good motion designer. And I painted this narrative in my mind. I'm like, I'm a good motion designer. And I just learned the tool. And every letter I made, I learned a new part of Cinema 4D, a new simulation engine, a new particle engine, whatever. And I sort of played the role that I cast myself in. Does that make sense? Like, no one had to, like, I sort of gave myself permission to just be a really great motion designer. With Apple Music, Apple didn't cast me in the role of design intern, so I was like, I'm gonna cast myself in the role of design intern, I'm just gonna do the thing that I wanna do anyway. And eventually, it ended up happening. With Mercury, no one was asking like random 21 year old to you know, reimagine operating systems, but I was like, I wanna play that role, I wanna do this, I'm just gonna do it, fuck it. And that's kind of like, you know, it, it ended up happening for me in, in a way. Um, and, and with MakeSpace, we, we had all these dreams, and I, I had dreams too, but I, I think I was too afraid to self-actualize and, and to really go for it. And to me, that's also, that, that will always be something I look back and regret. And, you know, um, but, you know, now it's called Sprout, and it's run by someone far more competent uh, than me at the time, Weiwei. 
um, and it, it's completely different, um, and it's sort of blossomed or sprouted into a new thing. So, something, something, circle of life, I guess. Um, and as for me, you know, if someone were to ask me, like, what are you doing right now? Where are you in your life or career? Um, I would show them this picture. Um, if any of you are familiar with Naruto, there is a time skip between Naruto, the first series, when he's 12, and Naruto Shippuden, when he's 14, and then there's more time skips. I would say I'm somewhere here. I have, you know, I was lost for a while, and I, I'm now starting to have a new sort of, I guess, uh, role I want myself to play, and, and um, I'm going to get there. Um, but right now, I'm still in the middle of my time skip, so by the time I come back, I'll be way cooler. Um, so yeah, as, as I, you know, wrap everything up, I kind of just want to uh, sort of impress upon all of you that you have the power to cast yourself in any role that you want. You just, if you think you want to do something, there's no need to wait for permission for someone else to cast you. You can just kind of do it. And you can do as many of it as you want because life is like theater in that it's ephemeral. Um, one day all of us will just be, you know, cosmic dust. And, you know, Angela Jolie has played so many roles. Meryl Streep has played so many roles. No, not one single role defines them. And same for you. Maybe one day you wake up and decide that you don't want to be on Broadway anymore and that you want to go work on operating systems like a certain dummy. But maybe one day you'll realize you want something else. I mean, I actually really want to be a stand-up comedian. Um, I think I would be a really good stand-up comedian. I can totally see myself in SNL. And, and I'm kind of trying to actualize that right now. Otherwise, why do you think I came here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for, for being part of my journey with me.